Bonjour. Good morning. We're going to begin as uh, soon as we can, so as not to get behind schedule. So I am going to be part of this panel. There are two reasons. The first is that, of course, this session is part of the conference, ATHS conference. But above all, it's under the aegis of the regional conference of the WADD, the World Association on Dual Disorder, which is very well represented by its president, Mr. Zellman, who you're going to be hearing in a second, by one of its founding members, Professor Miguel Casas. And so this is a session devoted to dual pathologies with a dual diagnosis, addiction, and psychiatric disorders. But it's going to be focusing on a subject which is not so widely uh, addressed. It's not very well known by uh, people in the area of addiction. And, and yet, it is absolutely important because uh, this is the question of neurodevelopmental disorders with uh, attention disorders, autistic autism spectrum disorders, emotional deregulation, uh, dysregulation, and uh, personality disorders. That Nestor Zerman is going to be talking about, then Patrice Louville, and then Miguel Casas, and finally Maurice de Mateis, who uh, is uh, just uh, in, at this moment finishing his PowerPoint presentation. So, Dr. Nestor Zerman is a psychiatrist and a specialist in addiction. He's uh, the chair of the dual disorder section in the University Hospital in Madrid. And he is one of those who have initiated this long pathway towards the study of dual disorders. And now, he is taking over the chair of the WADD uh, from Pedro, uh, who left us, and we have, a, we have him in our thoughts today. Nestor Serman is going to talk about emotional dysregulation and dual disorders. And you'll see, if you don't already know, this is a relatively crucial area because very often we encounter people without recognizing or, or managing it this specifically. Nestor, if you'd like to speak. Good morning. Jean-Pierre, I'd be very happy to be here this morning uh, chairing this symposium, co-chairing with uh, my friend, avec mon ami Jean-Pierre. Thank you a lot to all the organizers, uh, Archives, Jean-Pierre, and all the organizers the organize, organizer for this kind invitation to be here. Thank you to all the attendees uh, uh, friend and colleagues at the, this morning at this symposium. I think it's an opportunity for us to allow us uh, uh, to talk about dual disorders, and most um, uh, addiction and other mental disorders, and most importantly, their translation into clinical practice. Um, I, uh, we have changed the order of the, of the presentation, but uh, I'm going to introduce this uh, symposium with my first presentation that will be about emotional, this is the title, emotional dysregulation and, and dual disorder as a new way to think about mental disorders out, uh, out, out of the box. And you have translation and you can get headsets. The session has uh, simultaneous interpreting. It's okay, thank you. Okay, this is working or not? This way. Okay, this is my disclosure. This is the agenda. I'm going to introduce the concept of emotional regulation or dysregulation. I'm going to talk a, a few words about precision psychiatry. I'm going to talk about the, the genetic of emotional dysregulation and finally, I'm going to talk about the endogenous systems and emotional regulations. 
This is very important. Perhaps nothing is more central to the human experience than emotions. From an evolutionary perspective, emotional responses exist because they increase our ability to survive. The disruption of hedonic processes is a cardinal feature of emotional disorders, and negative affects are associated with alteration in the activation of reward-related circuits. Individuals modulate their emotions consciously and non-consciously to respond appropriately to environmental demands. Uncontrolled negative emotions may be disruptive to the pursuit of goals. Emotional regulation may emphasize the down-regulation of negative emotions, enhancement of positive emotions, and modification of the experience or expression of emotion in some way. The important the substance, substantial impact of emotional regulation on multiple aspects of functioning and health is well known. The assessment of patient emotional regulation in clinical setting is imperative for effective clinical decision making, prevention and treatment. Due to the lack of sensitivity and reliability of the current criteria diagnostic of mental disorders, we in, in, science, in clinical scientists have been interested in identifying in new ways in order to think and to treat patients with mental disorders. This is the uh, mo uh, most dimensional perspective. It's a transdiagnostic perspective in order to identify different mental disorders. One factor that has received a great deal of attention is that of emotion regulation, namely the ability to modulate the intensity or duration of emotional states. Research has investigated functional disruptions in neural circuitry, underlying emotional processing. Consistent with the research, this research can fix with different new classification of mental disorder such as the, uh, from the NMIH in the US, the research domain criteria, the RDOC project, or with the, the PRISM2 project from the European side. Emotional dysregulation is not always a sign of mental disorder, but is a key feature in many, including depression, bipolar, borderline personality disorder, ADHD, PTSD, disruptive mood dis dysregulation, autism, autism spectrum disorder, binge eating disorder, and of course, alcohol, tobacco, opioid, and other substance use disorders. The common symptoms uh, of emotional, uh, that we can include in the emotional uh, dysregulation are different, but we need to think about it in order to, to, to the diagnose in, in, over, in overall, in order to treat our patient. We need to treat symptoms, uh, uh, syndromes more than the criteria, diagnostic criteria. The most common symptoms are mood shift, guilt, negative thought loops, difficulty dealing with stress, angry outburst, high anxiety, depression, feeling of shame, self-harm, suicidal thought or actions, and finally, substance misuse, or M priming, M priming. Uh, there are different scales in order to identify this kind of symptoms. One of them, the most usual, is the, this scale, DERS. What does emotional regulation have to do with addiction? According to this paper from Nora Volkov, neuroscience has revealed that addiction involves a set of brain interconnected processes rather than being a disorder defined principally by a single behavior, such as uncontrollable excessive drug use. Addictive patients frequently suffer from emotional dysregulation, part of the dual disorders. Okay, almost most individuals in our society are exposed to adverse life events, such as the pandemic, traumatic situation, wars, and or are exposed to psychoactive substances, only a very small proportion of the people exposed to, mental, to this kind of uh, adverse events are going to develop a mental disorders, including, of course, uh, between them, addictive disorder. Why is this? 
Uh, we always, uh, the scientific com community agreed that one in 10 of people exposed to psychoactive substances are going to develop one addictive disorder. Why is this? Why is the, the answer? The single answer is in the precision psychiatry concept. As you know, we are living in the era of precision medicine and we have introduced the concept of precision psychiatry in the field of dual disorders. The key word probably is vulnerability. Biological and social uh, determinants of health are recognized factors that contribute to vulnerability to or resilience against developing a substance use disorder, SUD, and of course, other mental disorders. Due to diversity in genotype and environment, one man's meat is another man's poison. The effect of substances are not the same among different individuals, including those of different sex. Psychoactive drugs can also have distinct effects depending on the mental state based, of course, on the brain individual differences. You can think, for example, in, in children with ADHD, ADHD that we get uh, them amphetamines or a stimulant and they are improving of their symptoms. These same drugs, the same psychoactive substances are different effects in different children or different people. The self-medication hypothesis revisited from the neurobiological point of view explain why certain individuals, some individuals, are more vulnerable to developing a, a substance use disorder than others. From this perspective, individuals with uh, SUD use substances to alleviate underlying emotional, cognitive, and behavioral problems. Findings also point to a drug of choice model in which people may be vulnerable to a particular substance which is the best self-medication for them. People with emotional dysregulation do not seek all substances, but only those that their brain asks for. This is a very important concept in our field. Okay, we are, I have talked to you about the, the, the precision medicine, the precision psychiatry. We are moving to the, this concept. I think, I hope that it will be in the, in the uh, in the future. We, in this uh, way, we need to identify symptoms, syndromes, circuits, physiology, cognition, genes, and life experience in order to identify different biotypes, different phenotypes, but is, we are talking about uh, different biotypes. And finally, to get the best personalized treatment for these people. Some words about genetics. Psychiatric disorders are heritable, as you know. And genetic differences determine brain connections between endogenous systems. For example, I'm going to talk about opioid, cannabinoid, and cholinergic nicotinic endogenous system, among others. And their involvement in affective states, including, of course, dual disorders. Genetic studies are identifying genetic variants associated with emotional dysregulation and the likelihood of developing emotional disorders. But, okay. However, the influence of any single polymorphism is quite small. As you know, mental disorders are polygenic polygenics, uh, illnesses. And it's very important. Of course, environmental factors also play a prominent role in the expression of all mental disorders. Okay, now we are going to review some of the main endogenous systems and the relationship with emotional regulation. I'm going to talk about the endogenous uh, cannabinoid system, opioid system, cholinergic nicotinic system, and we will also mention the effect of hallucinogens on emotional regulation. D uh, during the last decade, all the research on addictive disorders was focused on the brain reward system, on the dopaminergic brain reward system. But we know that all psychoactive substances with abuse potential bind to some endogenous system, such as the endocannabinoid system, the opioid system, the cholinergic nicotinic system. Related to the endogenous cannabinoid system, the cannabinoid receptors are located throughout the brain and regulate different uh, functions. Among them, emotional, emotional regulation. 
this the music or I, I hope <laughs> okay I, I like it eh? Rima. Rima. okay <laughs> It's uh, affected my emotions. <laughs> <laughs> this is increasing evidence of the relationship between the use of cannabis and emotional regulation. There is some evidence that cannabis use can cause depression. But beware, the strongest evidence points to the reverse association. That is, depression can increase frequency of cannabis use or even lead to cannabis use disorder. This supports the self-medication hypothesis. There is preclinical evidence that the modulation of the endocannabinoid system could benefit patients with emotional regulation disorder. However, there is little evidence uh, that to support the use of cannabis as an antidepressant. CBD, uh, according to evidence, CBD reduces anxiety, uh, through the, the effect uh, affecting the, some kind of serotonergic uh, receptors and the activation, of course, of the cannabinoid receptor, and understanding how CBD acts as an emotional regulator may lead to its use as a treatment for anxiety-related disorders and, of course, substance use disorders. Okay, let's move on to the uh, opioid, the endogenous opioid system. The location of opioid receptors overlaps with brain regions of emotional processing. All of you know the opioid receptor systems and the role of the three opioid receptors, uh, receptors in mood regulation. As you know, agonists on mu and delta receptors improve mood and agonists on kappa receptors worsen mood. On the contrary, the antagonists on kappa receptors improve mood. Okay, the overlap between emotional pain, sensitive pain, uh, uh, per, sorry, uh, emotional pain and chronic pain, sensory sensitive pain is well known. Some patients, when taking an opioid medication, may experience pain relief and improve mood. In this case, they can develop a compulsive use of, of on opioid. Patients may not even be conscious of their improved mood due to their use of opioids. For example, tramadol, the well-known painkiller, has antidepressant properties. The antidepressant potential of opioids has been known for centuries, and recent studies of, from the last decade are showing that buprenorphine can help treat very common emotional regulation disorder in people, in patients without suffer substance use disorder, such as depression, borderline personality disorder, and other emotional dysregulation disorders. Okay, uh, what happened with the endogenous cholinergic nicotinic system in the brain? Oh, oh, okay, as you can see in this paper, uh, uh, nicotine, cholinergic nicotinic endogenous system affect the, re the, uh, the regulation of affective disorders, including the response to antidepressants. Nicotine may be a promising therapy for, paper, for patients with depression and cognitive uh, performance in late life depression. Of course, we need control trials of that. But we were, it's not just nicotine. For example, monoamine oxidase inhibition, MAO inhibition, is significant in a smoker, but does not appear to be related to nicotine. People with depressive symptoms might relieve their symptoms with this MAO inhibition effect of tobacco, coming from unknown product of uh, tobacco, independent, without relation with nicotine. This is the mm, reason that uh, a lot of people are smoking with emotional dysregulation disorder, are smoking, and, and some, sometimes it's not enough, it's not a, a, when we are giving them nicotine replacement therapy. As you know, we are uh, experiencing a rekindling of interest in the use of hallucinogens to treat emotional regulation disorders. According to this paper, uh, to treat depression and alcohol use disorder. 
psilocybin uh, uh, acts primarily as an agonist of some kind of serotoninergic receptors. And there is evidence for the efficacy of psilocybin in the treatment of major depressive disorder and alcohol use disorder. Both depression and, uh, and alcohol, alcohol use disorder involve emotional dysregulation. Okay, I'm going to finish with my conclusions. First, considering emotional regulation enable a transdiagnostic vision that allows diagnosing patients with symptoms of depression, anxiety, SUD, eating disorder, borderline, all the spectrum of emotional regulation disorders. Second, this perspective allows a broader understanding of patients that the diagnosis by categories and advances us toward precision psychiatry. Third, from a neurobiological perspective, the involvement of endogenous system, opioid, cannabinoid, cholinergic nicotinic system, must be taken into account in diagnosis and treatment of emotional regulated, uh, regulation disorders, including, of course, substance use disorder, that is, bona fide mental disorder. Fourth, when working with patients with emotional regulation disorder, it is, import it is important to consider the drug of choice model. Fifth, new clinical tools are needed beyond the traditional approach and integrated and non-sequential treatment. Six, also drugs effective in treatment of emotional regulation disorders can also be effective in treatment of substance use disorders that accompany them. The most clear example is buprenorphine. Finally, we can envision a feature in which we diagnose individual clinical biotype profiles and tailor treatment to these profiles. Thank you for your attention. I, uh, we are organizing from the WDD the, our next. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Why, 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 what, two ah, words okay. about, about my, uh, we are organizing this uh, next World Congress that will be next year in Mallorca, Spain. I would like to, uh, to see all of you then. Please save the day. Thank you. And sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry. no, no. It's a, a good news. A good place to, to I think so. For science. <laughs> I think so. Uh, uh, if you agree, uh, we can uh, keep uh, all questions and answers at the end of the session after the, the four speakers. Okay, thank you. Donc, maintenant, uh, c'est Patrice Louville qui est uh, donc, uh, psychiatre. Now, Patrick Louville, who's a psychiatrist. Um, We're now going to talk about emotional deregulation within the framework of a clinical, practical framework. And it's even more remarkable because it's not often done by the French. So thank you very much uh, for this initiative. And so the floor is over to you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Thank you to the organizers for uh, enabling us to uh, talk in s with such a prestigious audience. As Jean-Pierre said, it's, this work is, uh, was carried out by a small team uh, on the field in a Parisian hospital which has an editology department. This was this has already been presented quite a lot uh, here yesterday. What are borderline personality disorders? Uh, BPDs are defined as paternal Pattern. patterns, uh, emotions, behaviors, which characterize an individual enabling them to react to their environment and which above all are stable over time and which generally appear in young adults and which continues over the years. There are personality traits, physiological personality traits which uh, we will share in this room. And there are also uh, personality disorders uh, which are dysfunctional 
and in particular here you can see in the credit of DSM-5 for BPDs a certain number of traits of characteristics which you almost certainly know. I just like to highlight ample impulsiveness, which is very important both for personality disorders and which we'll also see in uh, addictions. Affective instability. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Seven for talking about this and intense and inappropriate uh, bouts of anger. And these uh, obviously characterize BPDs and also dissociative, severe dissociative uh, characteristics uh, in uh, stress situations. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Emotional dis deregulation it was already presented uh, is uh, uh, affective instability is a diagnostic uh, criterion for uh, BPDs irritation being irritable anxiety and the negative effects are also associated to using substances and in with high levels of craving, according to certain studies. Professor Simon just talked about this. Several studies show that uh, with uh, BPD patients, there are anomalies with the opioid system in the regulation of emotions. And certain authors have said um, that uh, and also uh, abuse impulsive behavior are f encouraged by negative effects in subjects with uh, uh, BPD and uh, substance uh, abuse. Impulsiveness is uh, a common shared uh, trait with BPDs and uh, uh, substance use. It's associated with the intensity of addictive behaviors and, and impulsiveness persists as a characteristic trait of behavior in subjects who suffer from uh, substance abuse even after stopping uh, consumption of these. And this is stable over time. And we also see in literature that subjects suffering from uh, comorbidity have uh, higher levels of impulsiveness than those who just suffer from one disorder. And uh, obviously a positive uh, association was uh, demonstrated. Dissociation, to change a little bit. We've talked about, we talked yesterday about I'd like to add to what was already said yesterday morning. I want to talk about dissociation in, uh, uh, according to Piaget's meaning. Bleu uh, talked about a psychic uh, in, uh, in schizophrenic patients. Here we're going to talk about dissociation, which occurs very often in the a tra uh, context of a trauma, which is was defined in 1969 by Pierre Janet. It's the dissociation, which is, a, 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 is considered as functions which are normally, uh, which you're not normally aware of. Awareness, memory, the feeling of identity, uh, emotional experience, uh, perception of time and the environment. Here, these are uh, the terms used in DSM-5. Others will insist on the fact that dissociation is understood as an altered or fragmented uh, experience. It's compartmentalized. 
and this can prevent uh, uh, in, in integrity information. It's often considered as a reaction triggered when emotional suffering is uh, can be uh, withstood. And this was described in patients who have uh, extreme experiences, such as catastrophes, attacks, and perhaps, for example, what ha happened recently in Israel. This will have created many uh, reactions of dissociation. When we talk about dissociation, the troubles, uh, the, uh, the abuse of substances is often uh, associated with this, uh, as with a uh, uh, abuse during childhood and post-traumatic stress. But BPDs is often uh, associated with higher levels of dissociation uh, than other uh, psychiatric disorders. And certain authors even say that the subjects with uh, uh, BPD uh, substance use uh, dis uh, comorbidity use the product or products to induce a uh, dissociative state uh, chemically induced uh, in the face of situations which evoke a form of traumatism or emotional distress which they are not able to uh, stand. Borderline disorders, many studies have shown that there were, uh, uh, this goes back to, very often goes back to childhood. If we just take a look at this meta-analyze of 97 studies where borderline subjects have a relative risk of almost 14 uh, of having uh, uh, a history of uh, early uh, abuse. And when we talk about uh, abuse during childhood, we often see five categories and you can see here that for person borderline personality disorders it's often it's emotional um, abuse it's not so much physical or or emotional negligence which are most uh, often associated with uh, borderline personality disorders and this sort of study you can see uh, emotional violence has uh, a value of 38. However, other studies have shown that sexual violence during childhood is also a major risk factor, but it's not what we found in this meta-analysis. Childhood uh, traumas are associated with uh, regulating emotions, uh, pers borderline personality disorders, we look at the study by Cavallo Fernando, which shows that there's an association between uh, traumatic experiences during childhood, violence, and uh, emotional negligence. That's what you can see in the table on the right. And emotional dysregulation, and in particular, there are three groups. Uh, And in the f the borderline uh, subjects, deregulation uh, plays a role in the association between emotional abuse and sympt borderline uh, symptoms. Likewise, numerous studies and there's, there's a, an important association between uh, childhood abuse and dissociation. This is a study by Watson with 139 borderline patients. 70% of these subjects uh, have uh, moderate to severe or severe to extreme uh, violence and emotional violence and negligence scores. And both emotional and uh, physical and the scores of dissociation. And here they, they separated uh, the two, uh, and with child, those who have childhood abuse, it's much higher in the high dis dissociators. F 
finally see uh, this is these are figures from uh Mesacte, Mesacte 2 which is a major study in North America with several ways enabling uh, the uh, analysis of uh, psychopathologies. And we can see that 3% of women and 2.5 men have adults in the USA have uh, uh, BPD uh, disorders. In terms of comorbidities, uh, these 84.4% 84 .4 have uh, anxious disorder, anxiety disorders, and 82.7% uh, have mood disorders, and 78.2% uh, substance uh, abuse. In, in the table, you can see the presence of pers borderline personality disorders in subjects with dependency with an addiction, of alcohol at 16%, and on the other hand, you can see the uh, prevalence of addictions in subjects with personality disorders. And for alcohol dependency, uh, this is 48%, uh, which is very high. In the third wave here, the we can see the risk of having uh, uh, alcohol uh, abuse increases with the, the risk of severe uh, uh, alcohol abuse increases with the intensity of the borderline disorder. And finally, two studies to remind you uh, in uh, Trull's uh, review. They reviewed 70 studies and around half of the subjects with uh, BPD also had substance abuse, very often alcohol, and inverse, conversely, 25% uh, uh, of those with al um, substance abuse have uh, BPD criteria. And in the 65 subjects with borderline disorders uh, over a period of six months, 58.5% had a comorbid uh, substance abuse. And subjects with uh, this comorbidity, at mood, uh, in more intense mood swings, generally have uh, more psychiatric disorders. This is what was said by Mary Donald in 2005, who presented the consequences uh, of uh, the use of substances uh, in subjects where you have this co-appearance uh, of, of symptoms. And these cases tend to be more severe. Kontan Selton looked at uh, uh, in addictology, uh, in uh, a day center, uh, uh, in addictology, it was uh, an outpatient center for uh, borderline uh, personality disorders, and we can see that in addictology there are numerous personality disorders, and so we wondered. Whether we wanted, we looked at uh, trying to measure in people with personality disorders, emotional regulation, um, symptomatology, and borderline, and um, previous uh, uh, other previous uh, pathologies. Those with a dual diagnosis, pro, uh, borderline, and alcohol uh, use were compared with other borderline subjects without uh, without uh, uh, alcohol abuse. This study also to aimed to analyze the relationship between uh, various variables in terms of comorbidities. 
And according to the literature, the first hypothesis was that individuals with borderline uh, disorders uh, uh, associated with alcohol have uh, more uh, difficulties regulating their emotions, and uh, they have more childhood uh, abuse and uh, psychiatric uh, disorders, which are more intense. The second one is the association between these variables in the uh, comorbidity group. The sample is made up of 71 uh, BPD patients from addictology and also for the control subjects uh, from uh, uh, outpatient, borderline outpatients. Uh, we have 61 women, 10 men, uh, uh, average age 36.3 years old. Let's go through this very quickly. They all uh, satisfied the uh, criteria of DSM-5. We evaluated the intensity of borderline uh, uh, with symptoms with the list 23. We used a, a questionnaire to measure the intensity of uh, addictive behavior. We evaluated anxiety and depression with the HADS and we assess the difficulty of regulating emotions with DR, DRSF, which uh, Professor Selman talked about. We evaluated the dissociation with on the scale of uh, DS, and we also used the childhood trauma questionnaire to look at uh, uh, a, a history of childhood abuse. Here you can see the first stage comparing the two groups. And as you can see, we didn't find many differences between the two groups. The only difference, significant difference, uh, was um, the uh, con uh, control of impulsiveness. And we also found differences in terms of um, violence during childhood and this is n not these are not the real results we expected as we considered that the two groups were uh, could be compared we created a new group of patients uh, borderline plus alcohol patients in the initial control group, they had scores which were significantly high in terms of the intensity of alcohol use. With a group of 45 patients, borderline uh, alcohol abuse, and here I'm presenting the results of uh, the correlation results and analyses borderline symptomatology uh, correlates very highly with antidepressants and emotional deregulation also with the dissociation which is what we call uh, the DS uh, taxon which is a marker of pathological um, dissociation and here you can see um, uh, correlation with borderline disorders, the overall score, and the overall score of childhood traumas. You can see anxiety, and it, the racial deregulation also correlates with this. This is another way of presenting what I just said, uh, the relationship between the different dimensions or aspects and namely the relation uh, by correlation with uh, borderline disorders. We then uh, looked at uh, regression analyses, the univaried uh, linear regression, and this shows that the different, the, the main dimensions, emotional deregulation, 
pathology, pathological uh, de, uh, disassociation and uh, childhood um, ex uh, abuse are all uh, foreigners in of dis uh, personality disorders, borderline personality disorders. If we look exclusively at uh, childhood traumas, it's only uh, shown uh, by physical violence during childhood and emotional uh, negligence. I've almost finished the uh, discussion now. We didn't uh, uh, check the hypotheses where patients with a dual diagnosis have higher scores than borderline, than isolated borderline cases in the study, uh, in our study, and in particular with the two uh, variables, we can see significant differences between the two groups. It's in the uh, control group that the uh, results are highest, but most of the scores that were done uh, f uh, show the severity of symptoms and uh, experienced by borderline um, patients in the widest possible sense. The score of borderline symptomatology is um, foreseen by anxiodepressive uh, symptoms uh, uh, De uh, emotional deregulation and to a lesser de extent uh, pathological dissociation and uh, childhood traumas. Uh, contrary to what the literature says, em emotional uh, uh, violence uh, is a forerunner of uh, borderline personality disorders. We didn't find a link between uh, childhood traumas and the dissociation and uh, pathological disassociation. I'd like to finish with this uh, diagram, which sums up uh, our findings, you can see the borderline uh, symptomatology is uh, defined by different variables. You have all the uh, components from uh, emotional deregulation, and it's, this is influenced by pathological disassociation. It's influenced by uh, anxiety and depression, and also by uh, childhood traumas, partly those that we expected. And I'll uh, leave it up to you to try to say why uh, the results didn't correspond with the literature. Thank you very much, Patrice, for this uh, French uh, research work in uh, dual pathologies. Uh, it was it's very welcome, and is uh, and complements uh, what uh, Anessa Zerman said, and perhaps serves as an introduction uh, for Morris, who will speak in a minute. So Nesto is now going to present. Yes, Miguel Casas. Miguel Casas, somebody that I welcome with great pleasure. It's an honor to welcome Miguel Casas. He's not only a very good friend, but he's also a pioneer. In many areas, he's shown us the road to follow. I remember some time ago in the um, conference in Sitges, where all the big names in science, uh, the neurosciences, and uh, he shed some light on these questions at a time when ideology and the obscurantism of uh, management uh, of these uh, behaviors uh, needed that light. Mi Miguel Casas remains a pioneer and is particularly interested and will say something about the projects that we have together uh, for the future. His subject today is talking about the neurodevelopmental disorders in their impact on education. These uh, neurodevelopmental 
disorders which are responsible for dropout rates in schools and universities. Miguel Casas has worked on that in a lot in with the Catalan University. So over to you, Miguel. And you can uh, speak what, uh, whether you want to do it in French, Spanish, Castilian, Catalan, or whatever. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. I can see that you're a good friend. Thank you. And thank you for having allowed me to present my paper on neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, educational underachievement, and substance use. I'm going to try and speak French. If that doesn't work, then I'll turn, I'll move to English. First of all, the title and the subject is difficult to present. I hope that almost everybody here believes that there is a link between neurodevelopmental disorders, educational underachievement, and substance use. But we do have a problem, first of all. The problem is that there are a lot of professionals, uh, health professionals, who don't believe that there are neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, in, in psychoanalysts, the psychoanalysis, they're rather reluctant to uh, look at uh, attention uh, disorders in the pharmaceutical industry. I don't consider as a real pathology. So there are some mental health professionals who don't see the importance of neurodevelopmental disorders for day-to-day -day life. But we also have a problem because there are a lot of teachers, professors, who don't believe that, doc that medicine, psychology, and psychiatry should be uh, introduced into schools. Uh, they say that's the world of uh, educational science, of teachers. But saying that there are problems that have an influence on the success in school of their pupils, they say that that's not possible. So uh, the, another problem is that there are a lot of professionals who work in addiction. They never think that there are problems in the brain, psychiatric problems, that can predispose individuals to addiction. So there are a lot of people who talk about this, but this, it's a divided world, and we don't all agree. I'm going to present a big research project which was done in Barcelona. And these are, it's uh, data from Catalonia. We, we, and we started in a village, you know, Capella, and then we began the project between 2011 and 2023. We studied 14,000 pupils. It's a st statistically sufficient number. The pupils from uh, 6 to 18, from 6 to 18 years of age, uh, most of them from 6 to 16 years of age in primary and secondary schools. This has been carried out in major Catalan hospitals, Valdebron, San John de Deu, and the Autonomous University of Barcelona, which is my university. Everything that I'm going to say has all been published by a group, and these are the main articles. There are more, but everything that I'm going to say has been published. So I'm not inventing anything, but I'm going to try and in interpret all of this uh, research. So what is the, the situation with schools in Spain? It's a very serious situation. If you look at what the OECD says, in 2021, and the Spanish Ministry of Education uh, in 2022, these are recent dates, school dropout rates in Spain are between 16 and 22 percent. I don't know what the figure is here. Having to redo a year in Spain is between 8 and 9 percent approximately. Uh, so it's not a good thing to do uh, a, 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 a double, a redouble a year. In French, we say 
to redouble a year. And I've, I've invented nini, nini in, in Spanish. It's uh, in English, they say needs, not in education, employment, or training. I didn't know uh, what that was in, in French, but between 20 and 22 percent of young people between 18 and 24 are needs. It's a, it's a terrifying proportion. And when we talk about percentages. We can't really see the dramatic reality of the situation. But when you look at the numbers, and that changes things, because in Spain, there are approximately 6 million pupils and students between 6 and 16 years of age. If the government accepts that there is a rate of educational underachievement of 16%, that's the lowest figure. There is between 16 and 22 percent. If we just take 16 percent, you can see that in Spain we have almost a million students or pupils, young people, who run the risk of failing at school. It's a terrible figure. And every day there are articles in the papers in Catalonia and Spain. And they're aware that it's a great problem. But the question is, what needs to be done to reverse this situation. Now, when we looked at our research project, I'm not going to present uh, graphs and statistics, but just interpret the results. You've got the publications, uh, uh, all published in English in uh, journals. When you talk about failure at school, educational underachievement, dropping out. What are we talking about? What is usually mentioned in the newspapers and television and so on? They say that there are family problems, parents who have divorced, uh, monoparental families and so on, or there's problems in the schools, educational problems. Uh, schools are very bad. The, the, the teaching is not pr appropriate, it's obsolete. The t teachers don't work, they don't do anything, that kind of thing. Then economic problems. Uh, there are people living in difficult uh, suburbs. Uh, or it could be cultural problems, questions of motivation, religion, and things like that. But these are, of course, important factors. But when you look at the statistics, and that's uh, the, the sinews of science. We see but the major, but the great majority of pupils who have these problems succeed in school. It's not true that everybody who comes from the difficult quarters who have divorced parents, uh, that they, they fail at school. That's not what happens. Because if that was the case, then there would be a lot more uh, failure in schools, a higher percentage of pupils. These are not causal factors. They are factors that can explain some part of the problem, but they're not really causes, root causes, because if they were causal, then there would be uh, much higher dropout rates in our schools. So if these are not the, 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 the main factors, what are the, the real factors? We need to ask whether our psychiatric or psychological classifications can tell us what happens when you have a child or a young man or a young woman with a, an IQ, which is uh, in the normal range. I think almost all of our children have an IQ, which is in the normal range. What has happened in their brain and in the personality of these children, or these adolescents, that explains that they're in good physical health, normal mental health, with uh, normal IQ? What happened to explain that they dropped out of school and developed uh, educational problems? There's no schizophrenia. Somebody said that there's a bipolar problem. 
but uh, that's uh, another another psychiatric problem. When we ask the classification by DSM-5, for example, the only thing that can explain what's going on with these children, uh, uh, their normal health and IQ and mental health, they go to school, they, that is that they are suffering from neurodevelopment disorders. You don't have any other explanation. The, the majority, uh, is, for the majority, it's the only explanation. Of course, neurodevelopment, neurodevelopmental disorders are influenced by all the other factors and influence all the other factors. When you have uh, parents who have a problem in child, or maybe has dyslexia or whatever, the family suffers, and the parents uh, sometimes uh, argue about this. Sometimes it could lead to a divorce. We know that. Sometimes a teacher who has two or three children, you know, pupils with neurodevelopmental disorders, it's a problem for him or her. Uh, it has a major influence. But <laughs> what is causal is the neurodevelopmental disorders. You could remember that these are psychobiological malfunctions which have an influence on all the learning process. These are processes which we could see have, been, have changed since prehistory. With a high rate of incidence, you can see between 18 and 22 percent of children have this kind of problem, and in adults, it's between 12 and 15 percent. Let's just give a statistic. That means that one out of every five children has this problem. So you'd have to ask the schools, and we ask the schools in Catalonia, but we don't get an answer. Can you identify these children in your school because they're there somewhere in Finland, Australia, Canada, in Aquitaine, and in Catalonia? Have you identified them? And the answer is usually no. We have a few. We've just got those who are very serious those people who are really uh, disruptive. But for the majority, those who have a problem of concentration and so on, or dyslexia, but they don't bother the teachers and, and the other pupils. So one out of five children, one out of eight adults. So these are the figures. Uh, uh, we can say that one out of eight of us uh, have this kind of disorder. It's, it's a very poor reality, but it's completely reversible if they are diagnosed and treated during compulsory schooling. If we can identify these children between 6 and 16 years of age and get the diagnosis right and, and the treatment right, What are these uh, neurodevelopmental disorders? There are learning difficulties, uh, dyslexia, all the dys symptoms, and also the attention, hyper -atten hyperactivity and attention disorder, def deficit disorders, disorders of the autism spectrum, and of course, all the disorders con concerned with communication. And those are all factors which have a real influence on uh, the performance of school, but they do other things too. There are factors of individual vulnerability. And what that means is that these are factors which mean that a small group of people, a small percentage of the population, has problems, whereas the major majority, the vast majority of the population doesn't have these problems. France and Spain are uh, countries with wine producing areas, but the 10 to 15 percent of people have alcohol problems. That's individual vulnerability, because most people, uh, 80, 80, 90 percent, we could 
drink alcohol without problems. Uh, vulnerability, individual vulnerability, uh, there's 10 to 15 percent of the population in Catalonia and Aquitaine who uh, have difficulties with alcohol. So these are individual vulnerability factors. So what are the factors that uh, give neurodevelopmental disorders? You can imagine that a child with these problems every day hears people saying, why don't you do this? Why can't you understand? See what the others do. See what your brother does. See what your cousins do. What's what's your problem? Okay, try and make an effort to get a, a good 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 score, good result. You, you'll, you'll never get anywhere in life. And every day they hear that for years. Every day, including the weekends, and uh, even worse during the holidays, because. In the holidays, they have to continue studying to try and catch up. And then you say, okay, I'm not, you're not going to be allowed to watch television. You're not going to be able to use your mobile phone. So this is a vicious cycle, vicious circle. I'm not going to put you in prison for that, but it's, it's, it's abuse, it's mistreatment. It's a mistreatment of these children because they can't do anything. They try. To, to, to reverse the problems, but they can't. If they're not helped and families and, and teachers are often unaware of the problems. So these are individual vulnerability factors. If for years these young people every day hear that, you, that you're, you, you're, you're a waster, look at your brother, look at your cousin, what happens? This is where one of the arrows comes in, is the emotional dysregulation. Because if, if, you're being, if you're told every day that you're stupid, you're an idiot, you're a, you're a waste of time, then after a few years, you have emotional dysregulation. And that's the consequence. It's not a new uh, pathological or psychopathological entity or identity. It's the consequence of a certain situation. And a reaction is alcohol and cannabis use. It's a re reaction when they're teenagers. And that can be complicated with alcohol and cannabis use disorders. It's an evolution. And in the end, we have the problems of addiction, and more frequent addiction in young people who have neurodevelopmental disorders. This addiction to psychostimulants, uh, ecstasy, cocaine, or whatever. So you need to remember what Professor Nestor Sermon said, that these behaviors are automedication behaviors. And what does that mean? means that this is what uh, Edward Kansian said. He's professor of psychoanalysis at Harvard in the 1980s, 1990s. And his hypothesis was that a lot of problems in psychiatry and addiction are problems that, that psychiatric problems lead to self-medication when psychologists and psychiatrists can't find an, an effective therapy. So the patients find drugs, drugs are very active on mental pathologies, cocaine uh, and so on. These young people uh, uh, come to be addicted to the substance. That's, that's the self-medication hypothesis that it's one of the bases of the dual disorders that we're talking about this morning. So we're talking about disorders, that there are disorders. Are there disorders or dysfunctioning? It's important for parents and for teachers and to for the educational staff and for the 
children, uh, young people themselves, not to be labeled as being ill. A disorder is an illness, whereas a, a dysfunction, uh, you could say it's an illness, but dysfunction means that it's reversible. You, you can reverse it. So neurodevelopmental disorders are disorders that, that it's just uh, intellectual inabilities, incapacities, and severe autism. All the rest are dysfunction. Uh, DSM-5 says disorders, but next time it should be dysfunction. They're not disorders, they're dysfunctions. The chain of dysfunction, if you identify them and you can diagnose them and treat them, they can lead to some very brilliant individuals, uh, some major artists, uh, sportsmen, sportswomen. There are a lot of examples that you could mention of the social and economic success of a lot of these people. Here are some of them, some examples, Edison, Walt Disney, Agatha Christie. They had neurodevelopmental disorders or dysfunctions. I prefer to say dysfunctions. They weren't ill. Or John Lennon, or the Beatles, Tom Cruise, Bill Gates. Some of the best known people in the world, they had neurodevelopmental dysfunction. So, Let's get back to the project that we carried out in Catalonia, in Barcelona, on 14,000 pupils, and it's currently being completed. We looked at some dozen, a dozen or so schools with very good economic uh, possibilities of the parents, and sometimes some very poor economic uh, situations, religious schools, and so on, all kinds of schools with these 14,000 pupils. And I'm going to present the results. They're terrible. The public centers in Catalonia only diagnose one or two pupils for every 10 who, who would need uh, support. Remember, I said that there was almost a million children in Spain uh, who had neurodevelopmental problems. Only one or two uh, out of 10 are diagnosed. In private centers, it's a little better. Well, uh, the diagnosis is a bit higher. We don't really know in Catalonia if that's because they do their job better and they, they look and try to identify uh, children to, to remove them because they want private schools to have uh, high success rates. We don't know. Some, some work well, and uh, some of the best try t to identify these pupils so that they can be asked to leave the school. What happens in countries of Northern Europe? The majority of these pupils are diagnosed because it's pediatrics uh, with uh, psychology and psychiatry. They deal with these, these children. So the, our conclusion is that the main cause of educational underachievement in Spain is the lack of diagnosis and treatment of neurodevelopmental disorders or dysfunctions in children and young people. And that has a terrible influence on schools, on parents, and on the economy, on, on the outskirts and, and difficult quarters of our cities. But mainly, we don't do enough for the pupils themselves. So what should we do in the educational cycle? We could say that, look at the diagnosis in preschool. It's difficult. The maybe too many false positives and so on, and true negatives. So that's why we started at six in the primary school, because we can all already see d the dysfunctions. We have educational underachievement. If we, m we can do it in secondary schools too, but in secondary schools there's a problem because with poor results, 
you can have dropouts, you have bullying, you have alcohol and cannabis use, non undesired pregnancy, traffic accidents. These uh, pupils have two or three times more chance of dying in a traffic accident. That was uh, in The Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine that these results have been published. There's aggression and violence. But you, you can still work here. But if you don't work at this level, what happens in adult life, in adults, we change the diagnosis and we say we have borderline personality disorders. We've already spoken about them. Or antisocial personality disorders. So this is a terrible problem. And this can give rise to addictions. So to avoid addictions and these, these uh, pathologies, these dual disorders, we need to have the right diagnosis, the right treatment in the primary and secondary schools. Just a minute to say that we're currently beginning a very good project on neurodevelopmental disorders and uh, university dropouts. Uh, this is done with BISIA, the Catalonia uh, Generalitat, and the Catalan uh, Foundation. Why? Because the French, uh, sorry, the Spanish Ministry of Universities says that 32 percent, and I'll repeat that, 32 percent of university students don't finish their university studies. And 21 percent of this 32 percent don't get past the first, the first year. That's terrible. It's terrible in primary education, primary, uh, terrible in secondary education. It's terrible in the university. In the University of Paul and the Adol Basin, uh, the university here, and the University of Girona, uh, we're beginning what I hope will be a, a major project, and I hope that next time we'll have some results. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Miguel. It's very sad to have to limit your time to speak. We would like to listen to you for hours, but thank you for your French with a little Salvador Dali accent. The, 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 this obviously uh, generates a lot of comments and questions. And if we have a little bit of time, then, of course, we're, I'm sure there'll be questions for you. So now it's Maurice de Batis that everybody knows here, uh, the professor in Grenoble in uh, neurology and ph pharmacology and addictology, and originally from uh, the field of neuro neurology. And he's also one of the French researchers who's been interested in dual pathologies very early on. And he's going to talk to us about uh, an issue which is often neglected, uh, whereas it's very frequently encountered. That's uh, disorders of the autism spectrum and addictology. I've managed to finish my presentation, so we're going to look at uh, the problem of autism spectrum disorders. A question for you in the audience. In terms of uh, these disorders, in terms of uh, knowledge of diagnoses and therapies, how do you feel? L please lift your hand. Not at all comfortable? A little comfortable? Rather comfortable? Very comfortable. There's not many of you. So it's uh, a good idea for us to talk about this today. It's not very surprising because in our training, we don't talk about this subject very often. And we can see today that things have changed a lot uh, from the historic descriptions. And we can see the uh, characterization knowledge uh, of terms and what they mean. It's evolved a lot over recent years. We can see in 2020, uh, 
we can see here the different causes uh, of uh, this. There's a very wide range of these. If this paper by Nietzsche, they forgot alcohol that we can see here uh, as one of the causes and which can contribute to the clinical expression of uh, uh, autism spectrum disorders. There are other factors as well, uh, from birth, uh, prenatal and at birth, which contribute to alterations of neurodevelopment. What makes this a complex subject is that can be different combinations. Uh, th there are many moving parts, and this contributes to the to uh, m making the uh, diagnosis so complicated. We can see the different characterizations and alterations that uh, occur for uh, uh, anxiety, ADHD, uh, phobias, and uh, oppositional or conduct disorders. And you will see this between uh, men and women also there are differences which contribute to uh, the uh, uh, to um, making the diagnosis more complex. And I want to talk about this because this was a, a, on a clinical uh, point of view, it was very complicated for us. We saw many personality disorders. Today we see lots of neurodevelopmental orders. Neurodevelopmental disorders precede everything else. So th everything else is going to appear later on in an individual. The uh, 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 factors in terms of personality, these uh, uh, happen afterwards. And these contribute uh, to the individual's uh, functioning. And so we n we can go and look at uh, additional uh, personality characteristics according to the patients. This is interesting. And here you can see that these neurodevelopmental problems that we talk a lot about, uh, ADHD, TSA, uh, presented by Ms. Uh, dyspraxia, dyslexia, dysphagia, we can see that it represents a very large, significant part of the population, at least 5% of the population. Uh, TSA is from 0 0.6 uh, to 2% of the overall population. 700,000 people with TSA in France. Uh, and so it's very uh, uh, underestimated. And autists are not necessarily characterized as uh, classically as uh, we would expect with the predominance of uh, boys uh, compared to girls and there's um, plurifactorial uh, causes there's uh, tr tr uh, trism trisomia uh, genetics and the prevalence of uh, TNDs which are constantly uh, increasing of course this uh, in certain uh, uh, areas, it's multiplied by three, for example, in Haute Savoie, in the uh, Alps. So there could be environmental uh, things which contribute as well. Uh, the diagnosis can contribute. We uh, diagnose much earlier, much more precisely. And we can, uh, Professor Katz was talking about the importance of uh, diagnosing early on to provide the necessary support and develop strategies uh, in harmony with the environment, and that's determining. If we don't find these solutions, if we look the definition, TSA is uh, characterized by uh, two uh, main uh, types of signs, uh, interaction, social interactions and communication, and c behavior and interest. We have to look at the three uh, alterations, uh, difficulty in developing, maintaining, and understanding social relations, a deficit in nonverbal communication, and a deficit in social or emotional uh, uh, reciprocity. And we'll see this in very, very different references. And we will also have uh, beha repressive behavioral, uh, stereotypical behavioral characteristics. Uh, 
uh, they're very uh, anchored in routine and are inflexible to changing their routine, uh, very restricted interest, and uh, the hypo or hyper reactive uh, to sensorial stimuli. When we look at these symptoms, we can see that there are uh, shared uh, symptoms uh, with ADHD, for example. Something is important. These appear from uh, very early childhood, but are not necessarily uh, uh, obvious. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and this is the same for TSA. It's not necessarily as the the social uh, channels don't go beyond the uh, uh, individual's ability to uh, uh, adapt. Then this is going to a uh, late diagnosis. Then this shows the importance of uh, evaluating and the, the diagnosis if this uh, affects the person's uh, functioning. It's a neuro, it's a, uh, it's um, a developmental uh, disorder. So you'll see that there's uh, so the problem is the strategies uh, for compensation and camouflaging. We have patients who uh, who will uh, mimic what other people do, and very often are uh, disoriented and have repetitive behaviours. For example, with food. They always eat the same thing, always watch the same thing in, uh, in terms of videos. And they have very, have um, sometimes very strange uh, centers of interest and symptoms linked to the five senses, hyper or hyperactivity, to uh, smell, to pain, uh, to cold. We have uh, TSA uh, patients who, who were using opioids and this is an underlying problem because there's hyperactivity. And these are patients, uh, and this is very inappropriate. Frequently, there are other associated disorders because this will uh, uh, enrich the clinical uh, situation. Uh, the more we try to uh, run after the symptoms, the less we'll uh, find them. We will have. The image we often have, a uh, caricatural image we have, is uh, an intellectual deficit. A third of autists, there are, of course, uh, high level autists, but uh, incessant have uh, very sp highly specialized abilities in calculations, uh, and this is not part of the diagnosis. However, something which will contribute uh, to errors in terms of diagnosis is there will be. A cognitive alterations uh, which will affect the uh, concentration span of the subject and we'll see but why there can be other uh, alterations in terms of uh, uh, sleep epilepsy in 20 percent of cases and uh, when we look at all the comorbidities this uh, uh, enriches the clinical tables but you can clearly see that the uh, psychiatric uh, uh, aspect is very present here and we consider that 80 percent of autistic 85 percent of autistic children have a psychiatric comorbidity uh, ADHD is excessively high there is a confusion uh, of characteristics we have a very uh, we have anxiety, depression, and other aspects of uh, bipolar disorders and schizophrenia. Uh, but it's above all ADHD uh, with, uh, and uh, when we look at the literature, we can see that uh, the comorbidity and, and uh, there are overlaps between the autism spectrum and borderline personality disorders. And with uh, ADHD, uh, there's uh, we can 
uh, look at severe forms of uh, autism and uh, attention uh, disorders uh, in very large number of stimuli. ADHD uh, patients try to s filter out all the information from the surrounding environment, and so it's complicated. When we look at this uh, literature review, we can see personality disorders and autism disorders. We can see that there are shared uh, characteristics, uh, so self mutilation, etc. And uh, in terms of the the certain confusion between the two pathologies. I could show you other examples between AHD and autism. You can say there's uh, a common dimension and then specificities for each of them. But when you mix the three together, you end up with uh, things uh, which are very confusing. And this is what's important to have, not a categorical, uh, but a functional uh, perspective. There are other aspects, post-traumatic st uh, stress, uh, uh, food uh, behavior uh, disorders, and uh, uh, gender dysphoria. And this is important because we have patients who are, have uh, 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 identity disorders, and this can change uh, things. So they need to be identified. Uh, when we look at addictions today, uh, it's uh, quite recent that uh, uh, these have been taken into consideration. These are Dutch uh, colleagues who have written several papers uh, in this field, and uh, including for children, because this is frequent. And you can see there's a, a very recent paper that shows that autistic patients will not necessarily uh, declare that they consume uh, drugs, but there are nine terms more likely to consume products to be uh, to manage their behavior three times um, and four times more uh, to manage their vulnerability. So you can see this paper describes uh, th we're looking at uh, copying strategies at self-regulation and this is uh, part of the uh, problem. What about uh, behavioral problems without uh, uh, substances? You, uh, autistic patients are uh, have uh, very repeated uh, behavioral uh, patterns, and if you look at this uh, addic uh, addictions, uh, uh, you can see here the addiction to internet when it's uh, TSA alone or ADHD alone, or when there's both 20%. So the comorbidity, uh, the dual pathology. It favors uh, uh, the addiction. This is important because often we talk with my colleague and we thought that uh, autistic uh, spectrum disorders uh, protected against other addictions because of certain dimensions uh, which led us to uh, believe this. But we it was completely wrong and I would say that one out of two per half of patients, uh, it's a true risk factor uh, for consumption, and there are explanations, biological explanations, because you can see in the uh, function of autism, uh, you have the uh, tracheal and neurotransmission associated, which uh, favors uh, repeated behavioral patterns, and this is what we get with the uh, reward uh, circuit. the similarities uh, in terms of neurobiology between the two, and there is everything we said before. It's the frequency of anxiety and the de emotional deregulation and associated com uh, comorbidities. We have impulsivity, impulsiveness, the uh, uh, tension span uh, disorders, uh, uh, sensorial overload, overstimulation, and masking camouflage. So we try to, so they try to consume like others. Except, if 
uh, accept that we can uh, go beyond our uh, own levels of tolerance. In practice, what does this mean? It's uh, a true. Uh, we can uh, we can have TSA. We have uh, t uh, personality disorders, anxiety, psychotraumas, and. Uh, uh, sleep uh, disorders, but very often the uh, most common are ADHD, uh, dis personality disorders and addictions, and we need to explore and systematically research these because these are determining in uh, care. This afternoon you have a workshop, uh, a teen who uh, was about the true master between uh, neurodevelopmental uh, disorders, and we will show you the approach, the dimensional approach, uh, with Lucy Pinel and uh, Isabel Giobarro, who uh, 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 looked at care for this, and how we can support and characterize uh, the, uh, the the disorders and provide treatment. It's an affection which is complex and heterogeneous. Uh, which uh, changes with age. Uh, it's not uh, it's not known very well, and there's a very limited uh, care offer. Its uh, diagnosis at uh, adult age is uh, a challenge, and all the uh, uh, tools for diagnosing this are uh, implemented for children without take, don't take into account the uh, sex. But there is a difference, so you can see this in the uh, adult uh, in adults. They're cognitively uh, capable of uh, developing means to camouflaging. Uh, this is one of the masking strategies they have. And if we uh, add comorbidities and products, uh, this uh, substances, this is even more complicated. Many uh, uh, female autists are not uh, diagnosed because it's uh, more problematic uh, to do this than with men. They can are, are better at masking or camouflaging it. Uh, they often uh, ha are more uh, likely to socialize. They often have one or two friends. Uh, they play more imaginative games. They have more emotional language and a less repetitive uh, behavior. So very often that leads us to think it isn't a, a case of ADHD, but it, it can be. So you can see uh, we have tools to identify this. I'm not a psychiatrist. And I use the, uh, the, uh, the autism spectrum quotient to give a score to show uh, because we need to uh, 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 reason in terms of um, dimensions. We have you can see all these different scales uh, to confirm the diagnosis with all the limits that we described before today uh, beyond uh, thresholds. And uh, scales. Yves uh, Giraud, in her workshop, will present a clinical situation and we will discuss uh, if we've had uh, to see if we missed something and what uh, support can be provided because it's always uh, an overall integrative uh, occur, it's a challenge for patients. There are uh, some who have difficulties uh, socializing. We need to change routines. Uh, that's very difficult because uh, uh, TCCs and TCDs are very difficult. They are can be adapted uh, not only to uh, uh, TSA but to personality disorders too. It's important to uh, to focus on. Uh, individual uh, strengths and to make the environment more favorable for autism. In terms of concomitant affections, there's uh, th a, uh, attention span disorders. Is it true ADHD? Because there's this um, lack of sociability which contributes to the difficulty. Um, with there's an overload of information that the patient is unable to process, a sensorial overload, and it's so it's not the same treatment. What is interesting is that we won't uh, uh, 
methyl uh, uh, f- 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 can be used. And if we see impulsiveness, then we can, uh, uh, our people so can be very beneficial uh, for these. So there are many questions that remain, uh, which show the extent to which we need to uh, change uh, the limits. Uh, these are elements which need to be explored to better um, help patients. And what uh, are the best approaches uh, to manage uh, these? You'll see this this afternoon. We'll give you uh, ideas uh, for personalizing care and we'll there's uh, true work uh, to improve all of these. Uh, so diagnosis needs to be done, and uh, this is our concern. If we want uh, a, a higher number of diagnoses, we need the adaptive tools. So here you can see rec- recent recommendations for adults. These are um, international documents that have been translated, and we'll give you lots of ideas uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank our team, uh, which uh, participated in this recent debate. Uh, It's just uh, three years old. We have the means, and we are uh, getting good results. Thank you. Thank you, Morris, for this uh, lively, uh, brilliant presentation. And thank you very much for the children, the teens uh, in our countries who (laughs) suffer without uh, diagnosis, without any solutions, and with the benefits uh, that uh, the care that you have talked about, uh, they could benefit from this. We are out of time, but there's perhaps a good news. Miguel Casas, who will take the final decision because the next uh, symposium at 11 o'clock here is also managed by Miguel Casas so it's up to him to uh, to decide whether uh, the question questions can be asked now you the decisions yours Miguel and Jean-Jacques Ledon where is he Jean-Jacques, are you here? Perhaps we could have some questions uh, before the next symposium. Just a word for the pharmacologists. I'd like to know, apart from aripropozone and arisproposone, do you use other treatments with this uh, synergy? And do is buprenorphine something which could be used in certain cases? We don't use buprenorphine. It's not reimbursed. Uh, it's a, a problem for tobacco. There are other drugs that can be used t- today, apart from aripropozole, which we like, as japipin, which is effective. It's also antihistamine. When there are associated s- problems with sleeping, uh, that can be useful. But you need to increase the treatment very, very progressively, because apart from metafidat, they can develop undi- undesirable effects, side effects. But with uh, depressive disorders or associated anxiety, the recommendations say let's take it gently because sometimes this can lead to overstimulation and an increase in irritation. That is true. We have used uh, large uh, spectrum drugs like uh, tricyclic drugs. When there's sleeping disorders, this is interesting, but always uh, moving up the dose very, very gently so that we can cope with potential uh, uh, issues that could come later. But 
the presentations in the workshop this afternoon will show that when you have uh, opiate, opiate use disorders, the first thing is uh, substitution therapy, uh, because we're using the psychotropic properties of the opiate. And that is very interesting, because you have extremely unstable patients who are very well stabilized already with opioid uh, drugs. I'd just add that the use of beta blockers uh, for to cope with uh, anxiety symptoms works pretty well in our patients. Uh, well, if you want to reduce certain symptoms, particularly somatic symptoms, and enable easier uh, titration, uh, propanol or something, and 40 milligrams in half tablets or full tablets, again, increasing the dose very gradually, that can also be a useful therapy. Thank you, Morrison. Thank you for all the presenters for this session. I think I have a question on a purely epistemological point of view in the appearance of uh, disorders, of attention, and so on. How can you group this together? How can we, uh, we can uh, classify uh, these uh, different disorders? And in terms of the perspective we should have on the mental pathologies, the neurofunctional uh, aspects tend to set aside the more systemic effects and the influence of in the environment on the occurrence of these disorders. I think these workshops, uh, I think, should be a kind of counterpoint because in terms of neurodevelopment, we come up against a very neurofunctional approach to <coughs> mental pathology, and we lose the systemic approach that we can have uh, with regard to these pathologies. A neurologist and not a psychiatrist, you have a very neurological uh, perspective on these disorders. Uh, you are, of course, an excellent clinician, clinician, but I think that it would be worth uh, having a counterpoint uh, in the way that we look at these and be vigilant about the emergence of uh, autism spectrum disorders and attention disorders, hyperactivity disorders. Uh, we would have, uh, we, 20 years ago, we would have said these people were bipolar. So I think uh, this is, a, this is a, a question on the epistemological uh, perspective that we could have on the symptoms and uh, the, the treatments, because whatever the treatments are, you could, whether you talk about bipolar or, or, or disorders or impulsiveness, but it's the perspective that we have as clinicians uh, with regard to our patients and the way in which we group together the symptomatic uh, elements to, to, to classify disorders on the basis of the hypotheses that we have. But it does raise a fundamental question, and that is, what is the, how do we look at what we're talking about? And are our groupings maybe not a, a bit uh, over hasty? Yes, of course, because there are questions of fashion and bipolar issues. Uh, because they have uh, bipolar disorders everywhere, and we have very severe patients that we don't see very often. But anx anxiety problems that have been neglected, they were a major element. Now the literature is uh, looking at them and, and foregrounding those uh, anxiety issues. It's an individual in their environment, and this afternoon the workshop will show just how important the environment is in clinical expression of patients, in their stability, and in the evolutionary perspectives. So it's the individual in the context and the clinicians uh, who can talk, uh, and I'm talking about this. Perhaps Lucy, you have something to add. I'm a psychiatrist and uh, addictologist in Paris. Thank you for the symposium. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, I hope the next session will be just as interesting. I'd like to launch an appeal on the term of self-medication, which has, I think, perhaps been neglected, and it's coming back in strength uh, in, in a number of presentations. And, and we've seen that in one of the pioneers, uh, Professor Kazas, in whose footsteps we are following. But we know the vocabulary. Uh, I, I come from the Bordeaux uh, school, and the, the vocabulary is very important for us, and particularly in dual disorders. The term of self-medication for me 
is something which we need to discuss as a term. Is it the right term? Addictive substances have never uh, healed any psychiatric disorder. They don't stabilize. They destabilize. They aggravate. We lose perhaps 10 years of life expectation. I think self-medication is a term which sometimes is one that we used to hide. And I think for patients, uh, it's uh, rather misleading. And the argument, uh, apart from my own personal opinion, uh, which is only my own personal opinion, is that it's absolutely not specific uh, to the use of a substance to feel better. In this conference, there are some thousand people. We've all done this. We'll no doubt uh, this evening at the casinos, <laughs> the dinner, so we'll be a bit more euphoric and a bit more happy to be here. And when we go home, I will have a kind of crash when I get home after the conference and so on. So. Yes, of course, we need to manage the emotional regulation, anxiety, sleep, and so on. It's, this is not a provocative because uh, there's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done, but I'd certainly like people to think about the uh, appropriateness of this term. What could we suggest in place of self-medication? Because one of the only major bits of progress in genetics in complex phenotypes like bipolar disorders and whatever is the fact that the best explanation is shared vulnerability, particularly biological vulnerability. So I'm really launching an appeal. I think this is an adaptive strategy and as it ends up with an addiction and it's an adaptive and adaptive strategy. Yes. You're right, we don't have another term. But it's important not to confuse things. Self-medication doesn't mean that uh, these drugs are, are medication. It means that the psychotropic properties of drugs, like antidepressants, antipsychotics, uh, anxiolytics, and so on, used by patients to self-medicate, to try and survive. But things are currently changing. When I was uh, directly uh, in contact with uh, Edward Kansian, he's been to Barcelona several times. Uh, we didn't think about the therapeutic effect of drugs, but currently we're looking at psychotics and antidepressants with cannabis and so on. One of the best antipsychotics is heroin, and that's something you need to know. The opiates are very good antipsychotics. We can't recommend them, but that's what, what it, where it is. So it would be good to have another term for self-medication. Remember that there is, when there's no substances, no drugs, we talk about self-regulation. Well, with a telephone uh, and screens and so on, you've got children uh, who kind of self-regulate it's the same idea. It would be good to find another name, but uh, it's not proposing drugs. Maybe it's the pharmaceutical uh, companies are going to do that. We're not proposing uh, just saying take some cannabis, take some cocaine, because things will be better. But they take the positive effects of drugs for these problems. So I would agree to you, with you to that extent. I think this afternoon uh, we can continue this discussion. Thank you very much.